Chris Ronan has worked in higher education and not-for-profit sectors across the USA, New Zealand and Australia with a focus on regional, remote and, and remote higher education policy. Chris is the Acting Director of Country University Centre, National President of the Society for the Provision in Education in Rural Australia, and an Executive Member of the Equity Practitioners in Higher Education Australia, Australasia. Welcome, Chris. Darlene McLennan is the Manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training. ADSET provides national leadership information and professional development for educators and support staff in the inclusion of people with disability in Australia's higher ed and vet sectors. Darlene has nearly 35 years of experience working in the disability sector, of which 18 years are within the, within the tertiary disability sector. Welcome, Darlene. Dr. Kylie Austin has extensive experience in the higher education sector, leading the strategic planning of student equity initiatives. Kylie has led national research projects that have focused on widening participation to higher education and is the current president of Equity Practitioners in Higher Education Australasia and the Associate Director of Student Equity and Success at the University of Wollongong. Thank you, Kylie. And it's the equity practitioners submission to the accord that we're gathering a lot of this data for today. So um, whatever you say may very well end up in our submission to the accord. Dr. Leanne Holt is a Waramai Berapi woman and author of Talking Strong, which tracks the development of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander education policy in Australia. She is Pro Vice in Chancellor in Indigenous Strategy and Adjunct Fellow at Macquarie University. She's currently the Deputy Co-Chair of the World Indigenous Higher Education Consortium and was previously the President of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Higher Education Consortium. Welcome, Leanne. And of course, we've also got the wonderful Nadine. So as I said, if you have any questions for Nadine, you can also ask her now. We're using Slido. I will be referring to Slido um, throughout it. But remember, Slido is also for you to make your own comments, not just questions. If you've got a particular burning opinion or burning evidence-based opinion, please put it in the Slido so that we can capture that for reporting to the Accord process. And we're going to begin with one of the questions that was posed by the Accord panel. And I might just take, why don't I just take it in order of the panel? Because it's the opening question. And let me just get it up in front of me. The opening question what is needed to increase the number of people from underrepresented groups applying to and prepared for higher education, both from school and other pathways? So a nice big question, uh -huh. <laughs> just a simple one. And we'll start with you, Leanne, and work our way down. Um, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, and the question about what can be done. And obviously, like this is a loaded question, um, there's so many areas that we can cover and it sort of may take up um, like you know, answer the rest of the questions at the same time. But I think that the primary the, the primary answer to that is more investment, more investment in um, programs like HEP um, and um, and ISSP programs, but more um, more investment with evaluation frameworks like and Nadine talked very well to that. Um, I think that um, a lot of what we did, um, and I think that's why the presentations were so good today, because um, I know that in our space, uh, evaluation is a real challenge. Um, we're so reactive on everything that we do. We've got so much to do. Everything um, we want to do everything yesterday because we have so much to um, so much to move. Um, that evaluation is something that gets lost in all of that. And so um, I've been in higher education for over 25 years and, um, and most of that in Indigenous higher education. And what I see when I look across the sector is that a lot of the time we're doing the same thing that we've always done. Um, it might have different names, um, but we don't actually shift. We're not as innovative as we could be if we actually did look at the data and evaluation and say, okay, well, this is working, but that's not. So investing smartly is probably what, um, what my message is investing smartly based on evidence base of what's working um, and not just doing what we always do and hope for the best outcome. Um, so um, that's a um, problem. And also um, I'll just add before I pass, uh, pass it on um, is that um, recognizing that the, these funding um, uh, these funding groups such as HEP and, and ISSP um, are supplementary funding. 
So how do we actually develop systems and processes that um, where universities also um, are responsible for contri contributing to that? And so that we're not just getting funding and saying, okay, this is the this is the boundary of the funding um, work within that that universities have strategies and plans and policies to say that this is our commitment but that commitment has to be aligned to investment so it's okay having uh, um, high aspirations but if you're going to have high aspirations then there needs to be the equivalent investment and that's not just monetary investment that's um, also structural investment as well um, so like you know how do we incorporate practice that actually um, considers that um, balance of aspiration and investment. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do the philosophical response to that question. Um, and it goes to, um, so numbers, you know, versus percentages is something that was um, very obvious in Alan's presentation. The percentages, if you only look at the percentages, which is how we are accounting for, um, you know, equity participation is the share of the undergraduate cohort. The increase was very, very minimal. But when you look at the underlying numbers, the increases were huge. Right, so in terms of the numbers of people from equity groups that are in the system today compared to you know 12 years ago is huge. And so it depends, the response to this question depends on what our aspiration is for the sector. You know, like how, how large do we want to grow the sector? And then what share you know, of the total cohort do we want to be from equity groups? So where do we set the targets? And that will absolutely change the numbers that we are talking about. And my understanding is from Mary, what you shared at the UA conference and in other fora um, is that the um, aspiration is for growth and that you know, like the aspiration in terms of equity groups is to get as close to parity as we can, right? So that's what we're shooting for. So we're shooting for seriously large numbers. And that then changes the game. And that led me to say, you know, earlier is that if we do not address schooling and the pipeline of, you know, young people and then eventually young adults and, you know, like fully full adults that will um, engage with the tertiary education system and with universities, we are never going to get there. You know, like, so that is really the, the, the bottleneck is, is in the schools. And this is where the investment has to be um, for us to get there. Plus, you know, like the really valid points around um, integration of the tertiary sector, you know, like, can we please articulate, you know, like pathways that are, you know, consistent, at least within the same state, you know, ideally nationally, so that we can e do easy, you know, pathway articulation credit for prior learning that we can stack, um, qualifications you know like it's 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 that conversation so um i'm not going to go so much into the universities um but what has to happen beforehand and you know like we need we need some guidance around the aspiration you know what kind of numbers are we shooting for and that will that will um alter the response and I would argue that as the equity practitioners and as we do our response to government, we should be bold. It's our job to be bold and to be shooting at, at the least for parity. Um, and then we can always um, face realities later on. But I think our job really is to be bold and to be pushing for the best we can possibly get out of this process. Chris. Um, I also have a penchant um, of being bold, to be bold. Um, there's two points probably just to start with. One is just around, I think, and Alan also in Nadine's um, presentation around what regional students as an equity group means. And it stagnated for such a long period of time. When you can go back to the late 1980s and read a policy document from the Dawkins era, it's very similar to how we talk about regional students now. And it's far more nuanced and far more sophisticated than that. And so we know that regional students participate in university half as much as um, uh, compared to metropolitan peers. And what we've done as a sector is actually go out and ask those students who are already at university, how can we support regional students to go? And what that does is it actually just embeds that structural inequity because then the same regional students, yes, they're better supported, but it's the same 20%. And in regional communities, there's privileged people, there's low SES portions of communities, there's a huge migrant population. Regional Australia is really diverse, and that level of nuance is just missed. So if we actually want to get regional participation up 
comparable, we don't have to think about what regionality is. We actually have to look at the marginalisation in communities. How do you study on country? How do you take those people who have so many barriers and how do you do it cheaper? And they're all things that I can talk for three hours on, um, and I'm sure we will, but that's something, I guess, a provocation to begin with. And just picking up on what Nadine um, in your presentation around the Queensland Consortium, it was really interesting for me to hear that $23 million over three years just wasn't enough money and we need more money to invest. Oh, no, that, and was, that was enough. What followed wasn't. What followed. Yeah. And then to pick up on the $7.1 million for the Regional Partnerships Project Pool Program, another terrible acronym, but when universities, and we were engaged as the country university centre around that, when universities looked at that, they said, oh, that's not enough money to go and do this. Across our centres, so 18 centres on three states, they said, wow, we can do a bloody damn lot with this. So when you shift your perspective and actually think outside of the institution and think outside what that interaction in government and get in the cracks with partnerships with universities, that's where the really special stuff happens. So I'll hand to Kylie. Yeah, look, I think that the partnership component um, and the widening participation policy that we're on, we're operating under nationally is, is flawed from my perspective and, and from the research that I've done as well. Um, we're operating in an environment where the funding is coming directly to universities. Universities have a really strong sense of ownership over widening participation and they're rewarded for the number of students that access their individual institution. So I think we need to look at how um, our, policy, our national policy is set up in order to do basically two things. Um, the first thing really is to look at the role of schools. And so one of the things that widening participation has done and the, the national policy context has done over the last 15 years has been to increase the capacity of higher education institutions to engage in this work. What it has not done is engage the capacity, increase the capacity of schools to engage in this work. And Nadine, from the research that you've done, and I know my PhD drew a lot on that, <laughs> um, but you know, one of the things that we do know is that for, um, to, for us to make an impact in terms of increased access to higher education at a schooling level is that those schools need to be highly engaged. Our university widening participation teams can go in and out, you know, five or six times a year. But at the end of the day, you know, there's 200 other school days that those school, those kids are talking directly to their teachers or community members. And it's how do we build that muscle memory and that knowledge in schools to be having these conversations with their students um, beyond HEP. Um, the, other, the other part that I think we need to do in terms of changing the national policy agenda is about how do we work together as higher education institutions and how do we achieve a nationally coordinated approach to widening participation. We've got kids in regional rural areas that are not getting receiving any engagement in widening participation and we've got kids down the road in Western Sydney where four or five universities are working in one school. And so widening participation itself is perpetuating disadvantage under in our current policy context. So, I mean, that, those would be the two things from my perspective. That's really interesting. And I'm very interesting, interested in how we better support partnerships in particular. So I might return to that later. Darlene. Great, thank you. Um, as Alan identified, the um, number of students with disability are increasing in, in the higher education sector, which has been really heartening. But when we look at... Um, Currently in Australia, it's 18 to 20 percent of people identify as having a disability. And then if you look at Western higher education markets like the UK and USA, our numbers really aren't that good, even though, you know, it's kind of showing it is. And we're kind of looking at the reasons for that. And one of the issues that we kind of come up against um, regularly is about the school and the expect low expectation of often of people with disability to access tertiary education. There's a really limited, um, coordinated approach to good transition planning, good, um, good, uh, I suppose, uh, what would we call it, a probably... <sighs> Uh, yeah, high expectations within um, the, that kind of uh, pedagogical approach to that transition. Um, one of the examples, I suppose, that I wanted to show is that the government has done the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is a massive policy piece that the Australian government has committed to, which has been fabulous. But when we look at what NDIA have actually saying about tertiary, there is very little. They did a five-year um, employment 
um, strategic plan to try to ensure that people with disability access employment, but very little mention of tertiary education. And as far as our argument at the moment is, nine out of 10 future jobs are gonna require a tertiary education. And we have to work to ensure that people with disability are left behind. Um, people also talked about the funding model here and the important to have um, really good investment. And an example is the UK government invests 50 million pounds a year on inclusive initiatives for students with disability. We currently have seven point something or other, I've probably gone up to eight now with CPI in the disability support program. Um, I know that the Bradley report recommended 20 million plus, um, which never came to fruition. And I don't want to put my pauper ball out here, but the ad set, which I work for, we actually receive $150,000. That's our base funding. I try to grab money from left, right and centre to try to do the work we do. But when Kylie talks about a coordinated approach, ADSET works with another program, the National Disability, um, National Disability Coordination Officer, to really bring about that coordination. Because I um, so often see universities going and getting experts from, I won't mention any of the consultancies that consultancy, you know, for so much money. And if you're actually wanting to produce a disability um, action and inclusion plan, which can make great um, and significant changes within your university, often that's outsourced to some somebody. What we're doing in ADSET is providing advice to actually help you inform how you do that, how you actually you know, bring about the good practice within the institution. And for that amount of money, it's good, good value, but also I think it's just, instead of giving universities some money, this coordinated um, and consistent approach, uh, I think could actually benefit people in the equity space. Excellent. So I'm going to jump around a bit in these questions and I'm also going to give, um, uh, go to the Slido. So I'm, um, just saying that up front to the panel, um, but I, I won't, I won't, you know, um, catch you too much by surprise. The next thing I wanted to raise was I thought Nadine's um, insight into the COVID supplement and admittedly locking people in their homes, which I don't think that can be repeated, but having greater financial support. I thought we should talk about that. One of the questions from the Accord is how can the costs of participation, including living expenses, be most effectively alleviated? And that is just so true. I mean, anyone working in this space knows that honestly the biggest barrier we find is that most of our equity students, our low SES equity students, are, are working multiple jobs and are just not get have, don't simply have the same amount of time as other students to devote to their studies. So maybe to start, I'll, I'll start maybe with you, Darlene, this time. Costs of participation, including living expenses, most effectively alleviated. Thank you for that. It's probably have to change all my pages over. <laughs> Um, the challenge often exists and, you know, it's really difficult as a cohort to kind of lump, lump everybody with disability in, into that same cohort. But, you know, we understand as equity protect practitioners in, in the room that disadvantage and, you know, financial means and stuff can just perpetuate um, the exclusion. And um, for people with disabilities, often part-time work um, is not an option because you're actually trying to study and also um, you know, support yourself with with your disability. And often I say to students that I've worked with that you often need to do three units because the, the fourth unit is actually managing the adjustments and the supports that you might need within your university. So it often um, is harder for that extra income to come in. Um, but also, yeah, it's that being debt adverse. I think that's one of the challenges is, you know, if you don't have a lot of money and then you actually see that there's going to be a huge debt at the end of this, um, it can be quite challenging to then accept to go on that pathway to, to further education, um, and which, you know, is a barrier in itself. Yeah. So. Um, Kylie? Yeah, look, I think um, I talking to colleagues in the room today, I don't, I don't think we need any data to tell us that our students are, are probably the most financially constrained that they've ever been. You know, we were sharing stories about how long the lines are into our student pantry queues at our at our individual institutions, and, and we've never seen anything like it. Um, I think a lot of Nadine's recommendations around the role of the Commonwealth in reviewing um, ab study, of study, youth allowance, and having a really um, streamlined, easy to access um, national approach to income is, is a really key solution in here. Um, but and, and making equity scholarships as, as easy to access as possible. However, I think, and this kind of jumps into another another question, but I think, you know, how can we um, as a sector leverage industry more effectively? Um, if we think about higher education as a tool for social mobility, um, you know, access to higher education isn't enough. It's about 
strong employment outcomes um, for, st for students as well and, and parity in terms of wage outcomes as well. And so I think what's really critical here is how do we provide students with meaningful employment opportunities to earn while they're learning at university? Chris, rural and regional areas, that must have an additional um, overlay. It depends on what paradigm you think about it though. So the traditional way of thinking is, oh, if you're from a regional area and you're gonna to have to move, there's a cost that comes with it. And that's certainly true. So I invite you all to just park that idea for a moment and just potentially think a little bit differently. So the tertiary access payment is five, up to $5,000 that the federal government um, can give to a student who's moving away from a regional area to go to university. So $5,000 just to start with. The Commonwealth Government evaluated the Country University Centre and found that per student to support, it's somewhere between two and a half and three and a half thousand dollars per supported student. That's it per year. Per year. Yeah, that's all it costs. So just on that alone, if we think about it, the cost to government is there's five thousand dollars for that tertiary access payment. Plus, then that what comes is cost on families, cost on the individual, all these other challenges that we're think that we're thinking about, cost for universities supporting scholarships, equity scholarships, other things to move students from their place. Um, and that's not to discount that because that's a very genuine opportunity, but we can add something in that actually costs the government less and that student can stay in their community with their support networks, with their part-time jobs, with potential employment into the future. So that's the type of thinking we need to look at it in terms of what's value for money. Because as a not-for-profit sitting on the fringes of higher education, the first question I get from government and universities is, oof, you're too expensive. And then if you compare our budgets to some of the budgets of universities and even on a per student cost, it's a very different comparison. So my sort of, I guess, again, a provocation is to invite groups like myself, like Country University Centre, like other regional university centres into the room because we can deliver different way of thinking, different outcomes, and usually do it um, more cheaply for the government. Mm. Nadine. Yeah, look, um, so many things. I mean, my, my response to this was literally one word and was sent to link. Um, we we because we know that um the um you know the upfront the student payments um of course fees do not have a large deterrent um effect you know i think they and again that's spelled out in the in the discussion paper it's it tends to bite people in the butt you know post university when they realize you know how how long this debt is going to stick around and i think in that sense it's 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 tricky um but as a as a deterrent to access you know like i haven't seen anything that says there's a strong deterrent effect um cost of living is very different and you know that's what we have talked about now. So costs of living are really the deterrent factor. Um, and there, you know, as I've argued, um, the the government through Centrelink has a real opportunity to address much of the problem. And then we layer on, you know, part time work and we layer on scholarships. But as I said, you know, scholarships is the selected few. So in in the three universities that we look. Um, at, it was between three and five percent of um, the cohort. I don't think we will ever be able to scale scholarships, so we can never solve the problems with scholarships. You know, that's it, it is the icing on the top. And then if we say, you know, like it is around, you know, part-time work, and I completely agree with Kylie. You know, can we have um, more? Uh, you know, different solutions and can we create employment on campus, you know, like can we sort of look into these things in, in much more, you know, systematic ways than we are doing, you know, can we look at um, in, in Europe, um, it's, it's it, particularly in continental Europe, it's very common for um, students to be placed in um, in companies while they are doing their tertiary training. Um, so there, again, there's models around, you know, like where, where that we could look at. Um, and then finally, for, for Centrelink, I mean, um, one of the big challenges we have, so the combination between job ready graduates or the intersection of job ready graduates with financial support is that the best thing for a student would be to drop load, but they can't drop load because they'll lose their Centrelink benefit. So this is this is where, you know, like um, two policies clash and collide and really don't create the best outcome for the student. Um, so I think it also needs needs a look at from, from that perspective. And finally, with youth allowance, you know, and the, um, the requirement to be independent often puts a barrier in front of those students from regional um, areas that want to move, you know, that want to go to the city and where that year really sort of 
puts puts a bit of a break on on that um, on that decision and that momentum. So I think there's lots of opportunities for us to have another look at. Um, yeah, and Nadine sort of took my sort of one of my suggestions at the end, but just adding to what Nadine said, because I've spoken to Ab study about this as well, um, the fact that students need to be picking three subjects to um, to have uh, to access Ab study as a full time load. Um, and particularly for, I think, any equity students, but particularly Indigenous students, um, the attrition rates in the first year are, are the highest. And um, and so what we have found is that students are, are picking um, three units so that they can get their ab study but only attempting two units so they're actually so obviously they're failing their third unit but they see more value in being able to access the ab study than actually the the value in um in like attempting three units and, and failing and so so they can get um, their residential cost options so they can move and live on campus where they only end up getting about $50 a week to live on after their residential cost options as well. Um, they pick these three subjects and fail, which obviously under the JRG also has ramifications for them keeping their um, uh, keeping their um, Commonwealth supported place if they then fail more than that than the one that they're just leaving alone. So like, you know, I, I do think, I, I totally agree with everyone saying that we do really need to look at um, the Centrelink um, processes and structures and policies um, so that they align um, to our students' needs. Um, also, I think um, the other thing that we need to be looking at is industry partnerships and collaborations. Um, there can be so much opportunity in, um, in partnering with industries. And again, I think um, it, it um, follows on what from others have said around um, like, you know, uh, industry partnerships as far as industry scholarships, um, but industry placements as well, paid placements, so that we have industry cadetships and internships. I mean, at Macquarie, we're quite, um, it, it's, it's quite good because we are right in the middle of an um, industry hub. So um, our relationships with industry, it's one of the really positive things that we can do and we can build, but we've found it's been um, very impactful as well. Um, and especially students that have placements that like long placements, like teaching degrees where they're going on placements or health um, and they're non-paid um, students struggle. Um, and, um, and that's detrimental to their studies. And a lot of them will drop out because of that. So um, I think looking at the life cycle as well of students and where the big impacts are financially. So I'm now going to go to one of the audience questions. Um, now, you don't all have to answer this one because I recognise this one's been sprung out of nowhere, but it's a very good one. It's got the most votes as well, which is what would be the appropriate strategy to bring student voice into equity practice? Who wants to talk about student voice? I'm happy to have a go. Um, so we um, started with that challenge of, you know, the student voice is really um, absent in much of the work that we do for developing the happy valuation framework at Swinburne. Um, so we absolutely started with the students and in, in helping to develop um, the framework, we started with um, student personas and student journey maps. So that from the start, we sort of had an understanding of the diversity of the cohort um, that we had at Swinburne. Um, and we, 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 were, we constrained ourselves to the undergraduate cohort because this is, you know, like the, the remit of HEP, but Swinburne is a dual sector. So we had lots of people who would pathway through. Um, we had a care leaver student who had started in the vet section and had then had come into um, Swinburne higher ed. Um, and we also have a large, through Swinburne Online, a, a very large online cohort. Um, so it was really sort of this, this microcosm of the diversity that exists. Um, in the sector and so we, we started with what the students gave us and then sort of asked you know like what are the really important um, services along the way how do they line up with their needs you know like did a bit of a gap analysis you know like what do you need at this critical junction in your in your student journey um, and then sort of um, thought about you know what what do we do with students who are um, very proactive in their help seeking? What do we do with the ones who will see, seek help if prompted? And what do, the, do we do with the ones who are really, you know, like stand back and stand off and, um, you know, like where help seeking is really not the socially accepted thing to do. So it, it really helped us, you know, like think that through in how we put the framework together that we hit as many of um, 
you know, the, the really critical touch points as we could um, with the factors that we included. So that's one way to do it. Hmm. Anyone else want to talk about student voice and equity strategy? Yeah. So we have, um, we have like in most universities, we'll have Aboriginal advisory committees um, where all of our strategies, plans and programs go through. Um, we always have a student voice on uh, that level. Um, so we have um, undergraduate, postgraduate um, alumni uh, represented on, on that committee um, and they contribute really strongly um, to, uh, to, to what we do and how we do it. Um, so I highly recommend that, like any committee structures that are providing advice on um, on our directions, um, the student's voice is highly important. Um, I think when we, is that working? Persist, persist, persist. persist. okay. Um, so in regard to kind of students as partners and student voice, I think this is, I think this is an underpinning methodology that is so critical to how any equity work is undertaken. It's about what we do with rather than what we do to students. And so um, I think when we think about students as partners and student voice, we need to think about it as a really holistic approach across our institutions. So, um, you know, a number of domains, teaching and curriculum, governance, um, program design as well. And um, if I look at a lot of work that's been done by some colleagues, such as Molly Dollinger, um, you know, the concept at a, at a program, you know, we, we need to have students involved in our governance. They need to be involved in how we develop up our student equity strategies and our student um, and our institutional approaches. We've got um, at UAW, we've actually just launched our review of our student equity framework and we've got um, an equal number of students on the working group as we do staff and we've got a student as a co-chair as well on the working group as well. But in addition to that, um, you know, when it's about nuancing who our equity groups are. Just because a student is a low socioeconomic student doesn't mean that they all have, that all, all low SES students have the same level of need. And so um, what is, there's, there's a whole range of tools like collabs, um, workshops, um, you know, rather than a process of consultation, it's about designing with. And I think that's how we um, get that nuanced approach and really service the needs of our students rather than what we think they need. I might now return to an accord question. And this one, I might start with you actually, Darlene, because this is question five around how can best practice learning and teaching for students from underrepresented groups be embedded across the higher education system, including the use of remote learning? Thank you. And I was able to find the number easily, so that was good. Um, so at ADSET, we've been working for a number of years to develop resources for educators which can promote good practice um, in the teaching and learning space. Um, one of those is around universal design for learning, which we launched probably a year and a half ago. Um, we've also got a whole heap of inclusive teaching strategies online on our website, and we run a community of practice. But it still saddens me, I don't know if anybody read the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday or The Age, but there was an article in there of a university I won't mention, but there were still barriers and access issues for those students with disability in that article. There were some things wrong with the article, but overall um, it saddened me to hear that once again, students with disability are actually having experiences around access. Um, and I'll give a, a shout out for a podcast I've just started called Talking Tertiary, which the first um, guest speaker was Graham Innes. And Graham talked about his experience 30 years ago where you know, he didn't have access to his textbooks or he didn't have access to the information at the same time as students with disability. And it just saddens me that 30 years on, we're still hearing about those, the stories of that from students currently exist. Um, you know, universal design for learning is, is one thing that can um, assist, assist, but it's also kind of ends up being a piecemeal. So we've got that training, but I don't know how many universities have embedded it into their learning management systems. I don't have the funding to, to find that out. Um, and, you know, we've just also released an ICT procurement guide to ensure universities purchase accessible ICT procurement. Um, you know, so there's kind of those big picture items that we're trying to change the culture within the universities. But um, without that attitudinal um, change or shift with universities that disability is... is um, positive and, and seen as an, I suppose, I'm probably gut, gut, 
rambling here, but one of the challenges I see within the university sector is many universities have got really excited about green credentials. They're actually seeing that they're championing that they're um, environmentally sound and, and that their procurement processes are, in, are green and so forth. We're not seeing the same around accessibility and disability. And that's, that's my dream that in five years, we can see universities as committed to accessibility and ensuring students with disability can access um, their learning at the same basis as every other student, um, similar to what's happening within in, um, the environmental movement. Yeah, I like that analogy. Um, Chris, what about you? Yes. So from a remote learning background, um, COVID was the best thing for online education. And prior to COVID, students who were studying online by themselves or with the CUC or RUC were the poor cousins, you know, camera in the room of the people, you know, little Zoom camera. It's become far more sophisticated and that's really cool. But it hasn't settled yet. And there's a sort of tension at the moment and a lot of discourse around, oh, we need to return students to campus. No, we need to work online. There's a tension that hasn't been resolved. And that's okay. I think it's important that we sit in the tension and acknowledge that. But what, I guess, from our perspective, we're noticing is that we can use this to think differently. And so, again, with regional students, we're trying to boost participation, right? We're trying to get the numbers up. But like I said in sort of my opening remarks, it was around the, we've got to target those marginalised people within regional communities and they will be the ones who are studying online. So using like the NESHI data, it's 2019, I think, data, but there's 150,000 odd, or roughly speaking, regional students. So if we're going to double those regional student numbers, there's 150,000 potential students for any university who can really lean in to high quality um, remote learning and online education. There's a huge business opportunity for an institution to do that. And the thing that's shifting, and I labour this point in every time that I speak at things, is that it's not geographically bound. The days of a university saying, this is my catchment. And I've sat in meetings where I've had senior executives on a map point to their regions, to their footprints. And they say, these are our communities. And my response is, have you ever asked permission from those communities to be owned by this university? And we see that play out in, in practical numbers. So if we think one of our centres in Broken Hill, there's 150 students studying in Broken Hill. They're studying 95 different degrees, so unique degrees, through 27 universities. But they're one learning community. And that sort of thinking is what's needed. So the thing about when you're in Broken Hill or Mount Isa or up in Cape York in Cooktown, you don't care where the university is. You're going to use the word of mouth from your peers around what is the best fit for purpose for me. So if we're going to boost participation in regional areas and we're talking about remote learning, there's a huge opportunity for universities because those students will come to you and the days of this footprint thing, it really is over. Do you think just as a slight provo provocation, there were originally, or maybe this has changed a bit as online learning gets better in its quality. But originally there was a view that online learning, though it was accessed, easily accessed for equity groups, didn't lead to great results for equity groups, at least in terms of retention and success. Do you think that's changing? It is because we're thinking about how we support those students. So we're, we're a good example. That the IUC project is a good example. There's an acceptance that online learning is here. How can we wrap around that student and give them that support? So when we're talking about the support that we provide, it's not the remit of learning and teaching. That's what that's universities. What we provide is the additional support that we know that equity students need. And you can wrap around those students in a really personalised and face-to-face -face way. So that's the difference and that's the value add. And because also within a university now, they're seeing their peers who are on campus doing the same types of learning as them, they feel much more included in it. So, Nadine. Yes, um, and I'm going to pick up on a bit of what Chris said and, and the presentation that Alan showed us. So um, what Alan talked about is that in terms of success rates, um, students from low CS backgrounds and regional and remote backgrounds outperform their cohort often, right? And we did a project, so we did a um, time study at Deakin that showed that the highest completing cohort of any cohort in the university were students from low CS backgrounds with an ATAR of over 80 that was the highest completing cohort. Imagine that field day I had, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there is no unique teaching and learning need of the low SES and the regional cohort, right? Like that's sort of what we've always struggled with in sort of giving our HEP money away to current student programs, right? Because you can't really point it out. So 
for the students where there is, for students with disability, for Indigenous students, for students with non -English, from non-English speaking backgrounds, right? There are barriers in how we put the curriculum together and in the pedagogy, you know, like how we teach. And that is, that is where the design needs to go. And again, I go back to the question of who are we designing for? If we're designing for everybody to access the system, then UDL is the way to go, right? Then that's where we start, not where we retrofit, right? So that's how you start to design teaching and learning. And I think this is the beauty of, you know, the CUCs in that they have this opportunity to set up from a bit of a greenfield side and can really start to think this through, right? If these are the needs of my cohorts, how do I design a support system, which is what you've done, right? Yes. Um, and if university took that sort of, attitude and approach, we would get very, very different outcomes. Yeah. Love it. Um, Kylie. Yeah, I, I, I just have to echo Nadine on that. And I think I think if I look at this from a national policy perspective, though, I think what what HEP has achieved has has um, encouraged universities to design effective programs for targeted groups. Yeah. What HEP has not achieved is institutional change to um, to designing for equity cohorts across the institution. So we have not necessarily changed, we, you know, we've seen the data from Alan in that how, how different our students are to what they were still 15 years ago. However, we're still modeling off very, very similar, a very, very similar model of, of higher education. And so I think we need to think um, innovatively, uniquely about, as Nadine's saying, um, you know, who is higher education for and what are, what are their needs and how do we design a higher education system holistically to enable us to achieve that. Interesting. Leanne? Yeah, I, 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 a couple of things and probably just building on um, what's already been said. Um, I, I think that um, the regional university hub funding was a really great initiative. Um, and, um, and we are also partners with a regional university hub in um, Southeast Arnhem Land. Um, and there's been other, we're now getting approached by other communities in Arnhem Land wanting to replicate that model. It's a slow model, um, but like, I mean, this is also something that needs to be um, recognised. And I like, you know, as you, as you could hear, I'm a pro evaluation person, um, but in evaluating outcomes, we also need to sort of look at like, you know, what is success, which Nadine talked about too. Um, and, so, um, and so I think that because what our students want I think post COVID more than anything is flexible, um, flexible options, flexible learning options. Um, and so with our regional university hub partner, um, we do a semester on, um, on country and then they transition onto campus um, because Indigenous students really also um, find value in that face-to-face -face and, um, and being, um, uh, at, at being in a cohort. Um, so um, so the firstly, the second um, probably builds on what Kylie said about institutional um, attention um, to the needs of students. And um, I really think that um, we should look at um, Texas accreditation and go back, uh, if anyone's old enough to remember ORCA, um, <laughs> um, it, it, from an Indigenous perspective, there was a quite a strong focus on Indigenous student outcomes and Indigenous learning and teaching um, within that framework. But then when it changed to TEXA, that was dropped. So like, you know, using, a, um, using an accreditation framework that actually gets students, um, gets universities to review what they're doing and how they're doing to a certain standard, um, I think is, um, is quite valuable in achieving outcomes. Can I dig into this part? This is the thing I'm really interested in, in how we, um, how we incentivise partnerships. Um, and bearing in mind that HEP, of course, did have a partnerships component completely separately funded and supported until 2015, and then it was all rolled into one. Um, and I think a number of you have spoken before about the impact of that. Again, as a slight provocation, I agree. I really like the, you know, I really like the regional universities model, the country university centre model. I agree that sort of taking, um, taking resources to the community level to have them determine how those resources I like. It has a natural simplicity to me that I think drives better outcomes. <clears throat> okay, what about urban areas? What do we do in Sydney, for example, where we do have five universities and they all are basically competing for the same group of low SES students and not necessarily growing the pie. Some of them are, but a lot of the time we're not. We're actually just competing with each other to try to get the equity students to come to us rather than go to another university. How can we um, encourage 
urban university collaborations, would there be a possibility of the equivalent of a urban regional yeah. university centre or not? Or if not, if yes, tell me about it. If not, what are the other ways that we can use collaboration, partnership funding to drive the lift all boats problem that often happens in this space? Can I jump in first? Um, it absolutely can apply in urban areas. So interesting about like uh, We Gibber and some of the other study hubs, there's so much demand from regional communities, 30 communities in Queensland, heaps in the Northern Territory. We cannot keep up, we are exhausted because it's working. And we're getting places like Noosa, we're getting peri-urban areas because they're thinking, okay, and it's community groups that are leading it. They're saying this model works, maybe not exactly how you do it, which is the whole point. It, it, it's, it's, it's what's going to work for them. So they can pick and choose and curate what's going to work for them. Now, for me, as somebody sort of working in that regional space, it's really hard to, to jump in. I want to to step into that space, but it's a possibility. So the demand is there for the model. And I'm probably at that point going to handball it to somebody else to talk from an urban perspective, I think. Well, if you have used your PhD on yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Look, look, from my from from a student perspective, having exposure to multiple university environments is hugely valuable. And we've seen, particularly in the UK, um, if you look around the results around um, the University of Kent and what they have done with their other partner universities down in the southeast of England. Um, when students have had access to multiple university environments in that pre-access space, mm -hmm. um, you know, the likelihood of those students going on to higher education is much higher. So this is not, um, I think this is probably one of the um, challenges of the Queensland widening participation consortium model is that yes they've carved up the region mm. yes we've got a nationally coordinated approach a state-based mm. coordinated approach um, tick 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 mm. um, but one of the things that it hasn't done is provided students exposure with multiple different higher education environments and, and what's really critical when you talk to students about um, the value of having that um, you know th those different types of experiences is it's it's where do I fit you know and so I think if we're talking about a metro based approach um, I think it's about how do we how do we create a separate organizational entity that can help universities um, have these conversations around a um, a national, it's basically an, like a, a national widening participation program of work where we basically say, UTS, you're you're doing this component, UOW, you're doing this component, um, and and we're we're actually working together to have a, a common curriculum in some of those areas as well mm. that can be nuanced to the to the needs of that particular region as well. Very quick point, sorry. Ad, the thing that's omitted in a lot of this partnership work is the notion of community. So even in some of the accord terms, talks about all the different stakeholders and omits community. And so whether it's in a regional sense, in an urban sense, that's the core that's, that's needed. And into the question that came online around uh, student voice, I didn't answer it, but what I was thinking was around, well, it's actually the community that shapes that as well, because especially when you're talking about people from equity groups and students in equity groups, it's a community that needs that support. So why not include them in the design? Yeah. And you can do it. Yeah, and I'd absolutely agree. If you're thinking about, if we're thinking about a separate organisational entity that can help coordinate partnerships, what it does, it allows universities to be around the table as a partner, not mm -hmm. as the lead. Um, it, it allows community to be around the table as a partner, vocational education. And so what we end up taking then is a regionally, a regionally focused approach saying as a group of higher education providers, as a community, as students, um, we've got responsibility to increase the educational outcomes of this particular region together. Mm. And we'll achieve way more doing that together than what any of us in, would do as an individual institution on our own. Um, I, I agree with all of the above, but what I would add is we need the data in order to highlight the problem and to really raise it to the surface. We have done this in Victoria multiple times, you know, that all of the um, outreach managers in the different universities came together, coll collided this big spreadsheet that showed where we all were in which schools and, and this, as, as you've said, you know, like there was huge overlap and then there were some students, miss, uh, some schools missing out, right? And as soon as you look at this and go, oh, wow, in my five partner schools, there's 
like six of the other nine universities. Mm -hmm. What are we doing, right? Like, so it becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly mm -hmm. um, that this is not a sustainable model. And then, you know, all of the above. But we need to start with the data and we need that, you know, like system that, mm -hmm. like, I, I would strongly argue for a national system of collecting data of outreach activities. Mm -hmm. um, at least if we could start there, if we don't even add in the students who we're reaching out to, but if we could just, you know, like map it all, you know, and see what the national effort is, that would be a great starting point. Leanne, I can sense you want to say something. Oh, I was just uh, probably just, um, I was going to say similar to, uh, to Nadine about the evaluation, um, but we've seen like the collaboration and partnerships work so well. Um, and um, and uh, like, you know, I, from my perspective, um, working in Indigenous higher education, I haven't seen like, you know, I've, I've never been competitive because as you can see, our participation rates are so low that it's not like we're competing for the same numbers. Um, so like, you know, I, I, I like, you know, and I often think like, you know, we run two Indigenous camps um, plus other camps, but we, um, but we run two Indigenous camps per year. And for one of those camps, we get over 180 applications and 50% are regional and remote students from across New South Wales. But we can only, we only, can only resource 80 to 90 of those students. And we know the impacts are extensive from the evaluations that we do and the data that we collect. And so like, you know, it's, it's a life changing moment for a lot of those students. Um, and I often think like, you know, what other universities are running camps as well so that we can get those other ones to actually get into like, cause I don't really care what university they come to have to have that experience as long as they get that experience and like, you know, and that creates the opportunities that. Yeah. Okay, another slightly provoking question. I've just been thinking as I've been listening to this. Okay, then. One of the things Nadine shot told us was that where the um, removing the cap worked best was in universities where it aligned with their strategic plan, right? So universities had already decided we need to grow and so out they went with the cap removed and recruited the lowest year students. But we didn't see that same growth in universities where that wasn't part of their strategic plan. How do you, in a more, if, if we're going to go and actually put money in, public money in, to incentivise a collaborative model, essentially potentially taking money from universities to resource a collaborative model, what's the sweetener in it for them? How do we align that to their strategic goals and how do we make them, how do we encourage them and make sure that they're participating in full? I mean, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really it's tricky. An, it's what an excellent thinking? question. I think the stick there is going to work a lot better. So I think the the, the stick, conversation... Stick not <laughs> sorry. I'm glad sorry. you said it and not me, Nadine. <laughs> I think the conversation we need to have is with, with some universities, and, and I know that this is... Um, you know, like a bit of a, an, an expectation that comes from Canberra mm -hmm. um, of we have given you X million dollars over the past 13 years, you know, tell us what you've done with them, you know, and, and I think you, you need to, if you address it from that point of view, you know, like and really put some feet to the fire, I think that might be the more positive uh, preparation to then have a conversation around, or maybe we take, you know, like a, a percentage off the top of your HEP funding of each university, mm -hmm. or, you know, you take them off the pool. I think I would take them off the pool rather than each university because that hurts less. Yeah. I, the, the problem with that is, and, and like, you know, I was talking about this earlier today, because um, within when we were um, reviewing the Indigenous Students Success Program um, a, a few years ago, um, well, they're doing a new review, so a number of years ago, um, it, we put some eligibility cr criteria around it to say that you must have an Indigenous workforce plan, you must have um, a senior Indigenous appointment, you must have an Indigenous strategy. So there were some eligibility requirements, but the problem with that is it soft because like, you know, what are they going to do? Take away the ISSP and then who suffers from that? The same take away the HEP funding, who suffers from that? So like, you know, what are the ramifications for universities if they don't do all of that? And I think that's a really important conversation to be having. Um, like, you know, it's got to affect not the funding that actually supports the programs of, of our communities that we're trying to, to, to enable. So like, you know, I think that that's, um, I think that we need to really consider that when we're, yeah. I, I think the tougher question is what do you do with the universities who do outreach really well? Yeah. That, yeah. that, that is a lot harder. Yeah. And I was going yeah. to say um, reputation is the other one. Like, you know, yeah. funding's one thing, but reputation, the two things I think 
um, uh, um, actions universities will is <laughs> is funding and reputation <laughs> um, and like you know and I, I know that um, I, like I was in a meeting and um, and um, and Margaret Gardner had said um, at the time like you know you need to get Indigenous outcomes on the world um, university rankings and that will that will move it like you know same <laughs> broader equity like you know how do we get it into a ranking um, <laughs> method so like you know. <laughs> Um, Chris, yeah, yep. just quickly, in from a tangible experience, yeah. when the universities don't have the money, but they can see that they have an objective that they have to meet, but someone else is holding the money, oof, that's nice. <laughs> because that's uh, that's kind of how we're working with outreach now. And, and I, I say that flippantly, but I do mean it, because there's great well-meaning people in every university, and the structures get in the way of those people. Um, but if you can find the right people, and if somebody else, so, so in our circumstance for outreach, it was a community-run centre, holds that money, then that sort of incentivizes that partnership to work. Um, so there's things about it like that that can be think. That's just one tiny little example. Yeah. 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 Kylie? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is a little bit a step too far, but the um, be like bold, think, Carly. Yeah, be bold. Well, I, think, I think if you know, if we think about what what is what is the purpose of a university, you know, and and the Accord talks a lot about the university being for the public good, and so if we have got a require like you know. It, Universities have got a key role in um, in the social mobility and uh, and how we work with our communities. Um, you know, the, the stick's got to be tax or re-registration, doesn't it? Like, is that, I don't know, maybe that's too far. There you go, there's a bold but move. But there you go, yeah. No, but I think you're right. It's it's always going to be a mixture of stick and carrot yeah. and what it is we require of our, uni our publicly funded universities. Darlene. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't got much else to add, but uh, it is a, a great conversation to have. I think the sticks and carrots is something that we have heard a little bit more about in recent months. And um, I really love that Re Leanne actually kind of reinforced that that could actually implicate on students. I think we need to keep that in mind when we, we have these conversations. I, I struggle sometimes with the competitive nature um, in the equity space. And I think we've got to be mindful of that, that we don't you know, compete against each other, that we work together. Um, some of the work that we do in the disability area, I don't see that com competition and it's probably because we don't have a lot of money to compete against, but we've got a really great model of partnerships. When we do something like the ICT accessible procurement, we actually reach out to the sector and bring a range of people to the table um, from different universities to actually develop the resource. And that to me just seems, it's just, I just can't, I get, no, I get blown away. I, I've come from the health and disability area before I started the university sector and I've just, I've just loved this sector for its passion and enthusiasm for students with disabilities and other equity cohorts. It's just the great, greatest sector I've worked for, and, and it's fabulous to see this commitment um, in the accord and the you know in the equity agenda going forward. I do agree with that. I think that the biggest I've always thought that working in universities, it's very rare you find someone who doesn't want to widen participation. I mean, people in, in universities innately think that there is a value to education and that all should have it. Um, but again, that doesn't mean there aren't impediments in the way to achieving that goal. So in the interest of time, we've only got about five minutes left. I will just go to the last question. Um, the last question, of course, is around changes to funding and regulatory settings. What changes would enable providers to better support students from underrepresented groups in higher education? So answer that question, but also feel free to sort of give your grand, you know, closing statement so that we'll um, end with that. But just before we end, I think another thing we should be thinking about, and somebody on this panel may know more of the history than me, but why is HEP... 4% of the overall teaching grant. Why is it not more? How was that figure ever come to? Because 4% does not seem a very large amount of the overall teaching grant. And I think there's always been a little bit of confusion about HEP, about whether or not it's an incentive or, a, or it's there to meet costs. And I think that that's also something we need to start to think about as we make recommendations to the accord. So last but not least, I'll start in the middle with you, Chris. Radiate left, then radiate right, um, and essentially you're summing up but also talking about the fundamental changes to funding and regulatory settings to better support students from underrepresented backgrounds. Well, from my perspective, um, there's some people in this panel who know far more about the funding um, than I do, but demand-driven funding keeps coming up as something. And we've worked in that system and then outside that system, there's pros and cons. But the, 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 the point that I'd make around um, DDF is that that in and of itself is not a solution here because 
from an organization like us, you need the support structures that sits around that type of policy setting, or it's just not going to reach the goals that's required. I mean, something like our organization is one of those mechanisms that sits around the DDF, do you know? Just saying. So I think that's sort of just a point, um, a bit of nuance that's needed in some of the, the policy levers being talked about. Um, in terms of vision, I think the Accords asked us to be bold. And when I think around rural and regional communities, and I say communities because that is the only solution that I see as solving, I guess, growing participation in regional and rural Australia. So there's, we have 18 centres in our network, there's other RUCs all over Australia. There is absolutely no reason that every regional or rural community and even peri-urban and as we've talked about in urban communities can have community-led solutions to higher education that has genuine access, irrespective of what university that student goes to. These centres open to every student from any university. That's how you're going to reach those goals. And for reasons that we've all talked about, it's not expensive. It, it, we're currently doing it already. It's not that farcical. So for me, when I look back, when I'm, you know, if I'm 50, then that's what I hope to see because that's actually going to make an impact. I am 50. So that just <laughs> <laughs> I realised I said that and then looked at I'm sorry. <laughs> Kylie? Uh, look, I think, I, think, I think the DDF has got to be one of the things that we need to look at. Um, you know, we as kind of Nadine showed, the DDF combined with widening participation, combined with other um, kind of other inputs into the sector had a significant impact on equity student participation. And so I think that that's something definitely that we need to look at. But I also think if we look at how we fund and reward universities, I think, um, you know, for equity student participation, I think we need to move away from funding formulated formulas that just focus solely on access. Um, but also focus on things like completion and graduate outcomes if, if we truly believe that widening participation is about increasing social mobility. Um, and I also think we need to, um, institutions themselves need to be accountable about the level of support services that they offer from a holistic, universal approach for all students. Um, and so that we've got a minimum standard, I guess, in terms of what supports are on offer from all students, sorry, what a minimum supports that are on offer for all students that are funded by universities. So things like HEP and that can go beyond funding minimum, um, minimum core supports and instead be focused on addressing, um, you know, the more nuanced issue, the more nuanced challenges around, um, you know, um, scholarships and, and learning support for particular student groups as well. Darling. Um, funding, funding, yeah, <laughs> it's a challenge. Before I kind of go on to funding, I suppose for us in the disability area, we have a legislative framework. Universities have a legislative framework under the, D the Disability Discrimination Act and the Disability Standards in Education and have a legal responsibility to provide reasonable adjustments. But the acts are, you know, they actually don't have a lot of teeth and it's a David and Goliath or a Danielle and Goliath situation. And that's a challenge I think often um, students come up against and what we've heard in when the review of the Disability Standards of Education happens every five years, we get the same feedback from students, it's not working and then we just do it again in five years time and nothing changes and disability advocates are actually calling now for review of the, the DDO. I know it's out of the scope of the accord but you know if we could actually put it in the accord that we actually look at a real serious change of the disability standards in education. Um, with the funding envelope um, you know I, I think I've talked about how little seven million dollars is and how far it goes and we'd certainly like to see an increase in the investment of students with disability. Um, you know often government will come back to me and say well universities have a responsibility to support students with disability so they should be lucky they're getting the money. But it's actually what I feel universities can put the barrier up. If they don't, you know, that money just gives us some leverage, leverage within universities to have that argument that students' costs will be covered around 40 to 50% if they have high support needs. So it gives us some leverage within that, um, in that, in our communities. But um, I think it's really important that we still have that money so that there's no barriers. I, I, you know, I kind of get overwhelmed with some of the barriers that exist for people with disability within the sector. But at the same time, I get very excited about the challenges and the opportunities we have to actually improve access. And, and I'm seeing this accord as this once in a, a, a decade or, um, or, uh, or two to actually make that change for the better at all equity groups and, and especially students with disability. Thanks, darling. Nadine? Oh, Leanne. Oh, Leanne. 
like, oh, no, it's okay. Um, like, you know, I, I also reinforce a demand-driven system that, like, you know, um, at, in at the JRG, open uh, demand-driven places for Indigenous students from regional and remote areas. But, like, you know, I argue for that to be extended to all students. Um, also, the removal of disciplinary focused student contribution funding. Um, like, you know, the highest number of uh, the, the stu uh, Indigenous students um, our highest number of students sit within humanities and arts. Um, so therefore we have students coming in in the lowest student, um, uh, the lowest social economic population in Australia coming into university and going out with the highest debt. So like, you know, I, it was just, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I need to say more about that. Um, I, I'd like, you know, concentration on articulation, like we talk about partnerships between universities and with communities, but also with VET, um, like, you know, um, there was 30,000 students come from vet pathways into universities at the moment. And like, you know, and I, and a high number of those would be equity students. So like, you know, I think that like, we need to look at partnerships with vocational education providers, particularly TAFE. Um, some universities already do it well, but probably more that are um, dual sector. Um, and the other thing is um, accessibility to higher education is one thing, but also accessibility to employment. So like, you know, I'm on a bit of a, a rant about um, about things like land type that actually um, challenge Indigenous students, particularly remote cohorts, um, in actually getting to, to become teachers. For, I'm just using this as an example. I think there's a few different examples. Um, but like, you know, um, if we're going to provide accessibility, then like, you know, that accessibility has to be to employment, not just to higher education. So looking at the long haul. Last but not least. Yes, Nadine. thank you. Look, um, in my mind, what the review is asking us to do is to think about lifelong learning across the entire education ecosystem. And we are thinking about universal participation. So the student cohort is as diverse as the Australian population, right? Like that's, that's sort of what we're talking about. And then if that is the conversation, like, yes, demand-driven funding is the, the necessary but not sufficient condition, but it's also, and I think one of the layers that we need to put into the picture and what, what we try to do in the best chance for all is that we define principles and smooth out um, the intersections between the different components of the education system, that we could literally go and have similar principles from early education into primary and secondary, into tertiary or vocational and higher, and that we sort of create that into a coherent ecosystem rather than, you know, having very, very different rules and regulations and support and funding incentives for each part of the of the system. And if we take students with disability, right, they are quite well supported in the school system, they get zero support in Victoria in the vocational system, and then they come into a sort of you know, like reasonably supported higher education system, right? So like in, in that alone, it's, it's mad, right? So when, when you really put yourself in the position of the students, you know, like we have to improve the attainment levels, you know, of all students, but particularly those in, in disadvantaged schools, in secondary schools, we have to, for the adults coming back in, we have to talk about enabling programs, we have to talk about bridging programs, you know, so that we, we enable adults to fully participate, you know, like in higher education, we have to talk about pathways, you know, from vocational into higher and back again. And I'd love to talk about hybrid products right um so at Swinman we are playing with um a course in cyber security that pulls together um vet and higher education units right into quite a different qualification plus puts a traineeship around it right like that that is sort of the stuff that we need to talk about to really break this up and at the same time integrate in a, in a new way so at, at that level I think let's not just talk about universities but talk about the entire education ecosystem and how students move yes okay linear you know like for some but in other ways really in out and back again and the final uh, the final point of this is um Sarah Shea on, on Friday talked about exit qualifications, right? How do we credential parts of learning when students need to access or want to access for whatever reason? We really have to get our act together on that as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. I know we're over time. I really appreciate um, you all sticking around, particularly um, with the, you know, having to leave the building and climb back up again, etc. It's been a wonderful, wonderful um, afternoon. I really enjoyed all of your um, 
oh, man, it's just so good. We are now pulling all of this together. There will be a submission going into the accord from AFIA, and we're going to be using all of what's been produced here today. If anyone has any questions or wants to, to make any more submissions, Slido will be open for another week. That's right, isn't it? Yep. So you can continue to put your views into Slido, or, of course, you can go back to your own universities and encourage them to... Um, put your views into their submissions. I'm just checking, yes, we have until Friday 31st of March to submit the comments in Slido. Um, and a recording of each of these presentations will be shared to everyone who is registered for today's event. So we've already eaten afternoon tea, deliberated, you can go off and see. Thank you again for coming and um, we'll see you all again soon.